All right, let's see what's new with the DART mission. Okay, that was pretty cool. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to be talking about some of the recent updates in regards to that very important mission for the protection of the planet, the DART mission. The mission that now also does this to your browser if you go on Google. And the mission that resulted in the formation of this. Essentially the first ever man-made comet. An object whose tail was over 10,000 kilometers in length because of the collision with a satellite that was roughly around this big. A little bit smaller than a car. And in this case, the satellite was traveling at nearly 6 kilometers per second when the actual crash occurred. With all of this resulting in these beautiful plumes released by the asteroid over the period of a few hours, and all of this witnessed by many different telescopes observing from planet Earth and also from space as well. And all of these last images that the probe was taking right before the collision ended up producing this beautiful movie that you see right here. And this is of course extremely important, not just for scientific reasons, but also because of what this mission is supposed to represent. An important defense strategy against any possible asteroid or any potential threatening rock that we discover somewhere out there that has a chance to maybe collide with planet Earth. But in this case, not just any type of a rock and not just any kind of an asteroid. And definitely different from what we've seen in movies like Don't Look Up, Armageddon or Deep Impact. These tremendously large rocks, very often kilometers in diameter, for the most part have all been already identified and none of them have a chance colliding with anything for the next thousands and thousands of years. But there is a type of an asteroid, specifically a near-Earth asteroid or near-Earth object, very similar in size to Dimorphos, the moonlet of Didymus, that's still large enough to cause quite a lot of damage, in this case it's approximately 160 meters across, but small enough to have still been missed by a lot of recent searches and recent surveys and still can potentially be somewhere out there. And a lot of modern studies using statistical analysis generally suggest that these types of collisions happen at least every few 10,000 years or so, producing an overall collision equivalent to a tremendously large nuclear bomb exploding in the atmosphere, followed by an impactor then producing a huge crater as well. In this case, anywhere from 1 to 2 kilometers across. And at least 25,000 of these rocks have already been discovered out there, but it's believed that there's probably at least 25,000 as many, or possibly even more. And since most of the larger rocks have been already discovered, and most of the small rocks, only meters across, don't really pose as much danger, it's really these in-between asteroids that have always been potentially the most dangerous and the most unpredictable to date. But at least in theory, we can still maybe discover one a few years before the collision occurs. And that's exactly why NASA, ESA and a lot of other agencies have actually been super interested in trying to find out if we could launch a relatively inexpensive mission and try to conduct a relatively simple technique in redirecting asteroids. No nuclear weapons, no crazy missions of bringing astronauts here and drilling on the surface, but literally a simple mission where you move something really fast, collide it with the asteroid and then nudge it just enough so that over a period of several years, the orbit of the asteroid changes just enough that it misses planet Earth entirely, making this a relatively easy to perform, relatively cheap and also relatively effective way to potentially nudge an object in order to avoid a catastrophe on Earth. But the problem here is that all this was theoretical. None of the scientists had any idea what's actually going to happen when the mission does collide with the asteroid, for several reasons. One, we don't exactly know what some of these asteroids are made out of and how exactly they are composed on the inside. For example, if they're very hard and very solid, they're probably not going to be nudged enough and will still be in a relatively similar orbit, thus requiring a much different technique. In this case, possibly nuclear weapons, because the push here would be enough to nudge pretty much anything. On the other hand, if the asteroids of this size are mostly just rubble, sort of held together by gravity, but not really possessing a lot of solidness on the inside and basically resembling a kind of a snowball, this would produce an entirely different effect when something does collide with the asteroid. And that's actually exactly what happened this time. As a matter of fact, the scientists in this case completely underestimated how effective this technique would be, with this picture alone showing us that the effects were tremendously powerful and way more dramatic than anyone ever thought. So, for this mission to be successful, the scientists only wanted to move or nudge this asteroid, changing its orbit by just over one minute. The original orbit of Dimorphos took it approximately 11 hours, 55 minutes and 18 seconds to orbit around its partner, Didymus, 
at the average speed of about 0.174 meters per second, or approximately 17 centimeters per second. And so in this case, just a change of about one minute would have been enough to call this mission a success. But the recent observations from several observatories, specifically four observatories in South Africa, Chile, and two in California and West Virginia, that used multi-frequency observations including radar measurements, were able to finally calculate a relatively accurate change in its orbit, with the conclusion being that the mission was a success by nearly 30 times. The orbit changed by 32 minutes, or approximately 4%. It used to be 11 hours 55 minutes, it's now 11 hours 23 minutes. And that's literally beyond anyone's expectations, and actually creates a bit of a mystery. Nobody knows why it was so dramatic, and what exactly happened after the collision to create this additional boost. Now, there are currently some speculations from several scientists, with one speculation actually taking us back to this picture, suggesting that maybe after the collision, because the scientists have also observed a dramatic change in brightness, with this asteroid increasing in brightness by three times, this unusual event also created a kind of ejecta that basically acted like a small engine. Sort of acting like an engine, creating a bit more propulsion, increasing the velocity of the asteroid as it orbits around its partner. And since in this case this is exactly the type of an asteroid that we're actually trying to learn how to redirect, if we ever discover one on a collision with planet Earth, the results from this mission right now are extremely promising. It means that even a small probe, in theory, can actually redirect an asteroid quite dramatically, but in this case, using effects we don't entirely understand just yet. There seems to be some kind of an additional effect from the debris itself, that's generated by the pile of rocks that these asteroids are made from, with the recoil from the ejecta amplifying the effects of the collision even more. Which to some extent might resemble something we actually see naturally happening on the asteroids from various effects from the Sun. For example, there's something known as the Yarkovsky effect, which tends to heat up one side of the asteroid and then produces a bit of a propulsion that ends up changing its orbit over time. These effects are pretty well known to us and they actually produce the most chaotic motion of the asteroids in the night skies, but in this case it could be actually the extreme case of this, where the actual emissions from the asteroid are the result of all of the kinetic motion from the collision being transferred into the asteroid and then causing it to suddenly have ridiculously powerful emissions. Which is exactly why we then saw this unusual tail that was 10,000 kilometers in length. Although I'm sure it will probably take a few months or possibly even a few years before the scientists can finalize their conclusion and come up with the actual reason of why all of this happened, but more importantly solidify the strategy for when we actually have to use this one day in the future, because in this case it's not really the question of if, it's really the question of when. Just based on the evidence from craters around the planet, we know that these types of collisions are relatively frequent, so we do have to be aware, which is also exactly why NASA has this mission planned to be launched in 2026. NEO Surveyor, the mission that you can learn more about in the link in the description, is going to be specifically designed to look for more of these objects similar to the one we just hit. Because as I mentioned before, these are currently the most dangerous types of asteroids, simply because we haven't really found as many as other asteroids, and simply because due to their size, their collision would be equivalent to a major nuclear bomb detonation making this NASA mission probably one of the most important ones in terms of the idea of planetary defense. Which is also why pretty much all major telescopes were actively trying to observe it just to see what they discover. But obviously there are some other techniques that NASA still wants to test in the future, especially the techniques that might have a little bit more control in terms of the actual redirection of the orbit. I mean in this case, if you hit the asteroid possibly hard enough, it might unfortunately change its orbit in such an unpredictable way that instead of hitting the planet in, for example, two years, it might hit it in five, but with even more power. But NASA does actually have other theoretical techniques that one day it wants to test, including some techniques that involve a little bit more control when it comes to the orbital change. In this case, this collision does produce a bit of uncertainty with the final orbit. But one day, we might be able to also test Gravity Tractor, a slightly similar, but still different idea. Here, instead of colliding a spacecraft, you actually place it in orbit around the asteroid, which then, over time, starts to slowly pull it away from its original orbit and makes it shift its orbit by just the right amount, with a lot more precision and also a lot more control. As a matter of fact, using Gravity Tractor, at least in theory, we could one day position an asteroid in a perfect orbit exactly where we want it to be. 
but this is still just theory and there's no practical mission planned for the upcoming future. As a matter of fact, because of the success of the DART mission, I don't even know if NASA is going to be planning anything else afterwards, because DART just showed us that maybe this is all we need. But I'm personally more interested in more details and specifically in the answers to that mystery of what actually caused all of this extra propulsion. And that's exactly why I'm definitely going to be coming back to this in the next few months when we find out why the Morphos right here was moved by such a tremendous amount compared to what the scientists thought it's going to be moved by. And if you'd like to learn more, subscribe just so that you don't miss that video. Anyway, until that future video, thank you for watching, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining general membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.